WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM's Master of Business Administration is designed to accommodate the career needs of professionals across a variety of work organizations. More information at business.udmercy.edu. Metro, a 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. And I'm Nick Austin. Today on the program, President Joe Biden visits Detroit amid growing calls from other Democrats to step down in his reelection bid. We'll talk to Detroit Democrat and Michigan Speaker of the House Joe Tate to get his thoughts on what the party should do at the top of the ticket. But first, nature is calling, but not in that way. The Joe Louis Greenway construction is wrapping its way around Detroit. And once complete, the project will stretch 27 miles and connect 23 Detroit neighborhoods with bike and pedestrian paths. And now, thanks to a recent $20 million federal grant, the Joe Louis Greenway will connect to the Iron Bell Trail, another trail project in the state that is 2,000 miles long. If you're feeling adventurous or and these trails are calling your name, or maybe you want to go up there to kind of figure out if I can make it up there, you soon will be able to travel from Belle Isle to the Upper Peninsula by way of the Joe Lewis Greenway and the Iron Bell Trail, which is really, really cool. To discuss the new grant and next steps for the project, we're joined by Joe Lewis Greenway Executive Director, Leona Medley. Leona, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I, I said uh, long-time listener, first-time caller, so you know I'm excited to be here with both of you. Hey. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, and, you know, I forgot to ask you before the show, are you from the city of Detroit? Born and raised. Still oh, live what, here. What part? Um, so uh, born on the west side, mm-hmm. so Seven Mile, and then since seven years old, been on the east side. So yeah. I, I literally still live in the neighborhood that I've lived in since 1993. Uh, graduated from Jared Finney High School in, in the 90s and uh, raising my son in that same neighborhood. I just love that so much. So just having that back story, that background, that information, doing this work that you're doing feels like, I mean, you're improving your neighborhood and your community for your residents and for yourself and your family in the future. So if you can, just go into what the Joe Lewis Greenway is and what it means to Detroit. Yeah, um, th- you know, that's just such a great way to set it up uh, in terms of just like my history and connection to this city. You know, I think about when I was growing up, you know, walking to parks and doing all that amazing stuff and having amazing green space to go to and wonderful experiences. And so now the Joe Louis Greenway is this, you know, 29.7 miles right now. So, <laughs> so it's 29.7 miles and potentially growing as the city of Detroit continues to do community engagement. But it's this 29.7 mile recreational path. And as you share with the listeners in the onset, it is this wonderful project that is connecting the riverfront on the south, really, you know, on the south of our city to the neighborhoods in the north. So for me, it is this idea that the city of Detroit, the residents who live here get to have this beautiful, nationally recognized riverfront and amazing trails and green space right behind their house in their neighborhood. So we're thinking about the community engagement aspect of it and the the point seven there. So still looking to expand that down and expand it. Talk about what community engagement looks like when we're we're expanding that greenway and trying to see where it's going to fit and how it's going to divert. And, you know, so what does that look like? Yeah, that's that's another wonderful one. So I, I just encourage all of your listeners, if they have not gone to the city of Detroit's Joe Louis Greenway, Um, page to do so and sign up for notifications about all of the public meetings. Um, So the community engagement started uh, back in 2017, 2018, uh, with the city of Detroit going out uh, and really adopting the framework plan from the Inner Circle Greenway Group. Uh, And so this is not a new idea. This idea about a greenway and, and a path, right, And it's less about just a path, but it's how do we reconnect our city? Uh, While we are the city that built the automobile, we oftentimes, I think, forget that about 30 percent of Detroit residents do not have access to an automobile. And so we need methods of transportation, whether it's bus, whether it is, you know, paved streets, 
or Joe's Greenway paths like that to allow people to get to the things that they need to actually function in life. When I was in high school, I walked to school, I caught the bus, I did all of those things. So now the Joe Lewis Greenway, this 29.7 mile project started with the Inner Circle Greenway, the city adopted their plan, and then began a series of over 160 meetings, going to churches and community groups, existing meetings, uh, talking about the plan and using working with the community, not using, but working with the community to identify what the route would look like. So when we say that the Joe Lewis Greenway is a community design vision, it, it really is. And the community engagement is still ongoing. Mm, I love that. So Liana, right now we're talking to the Joe Lewis Greenway Executive Director, Liana Metley. Um, thinking about the Greenway, the connection uh, between Detroit and Dearborn and Hamtramck and Highland Park, what other cities are you guys in conversation with to see where we can go? So, you know, the wonderful thing about this project, the city of Detroit was able to acquire, I believe it's eight miles of rail line to make this possible. And some of that rail line is in the city of Hamtramck. I mean, sorry, the city of Highland Park. But when we think about making it connected, those those cities are the main ones that we're talking to about the about the Greenway. Uh, but for me, it's about the possibility for the future. And with the Iron Bale Trail and understanding how we want to continue to reconnect our region. And I look at the Joe Louis Greenway as a regional project, not just a city of Detroit project, but by the fact that it's connecting 23 neighborhoods in Detroit to Highland Park, to Dearborn, to Hamtramck. You know, the city of Dearborn got a grant from, I believe, the state, uh, $24 million to improve Warren, which will take the connection of the Greenway there at the trailhead deeper into Dearborn. Highland Park is excited about the crossing there at Woodward and the connection in their city. And Hamtramck is doing an amazing job as well. The idea that the potential for the Greenway to go down the alley, connect to other businesses and things like that. I mean, it's such a a project with so much potential and to truly reconnect our cities. Indeed, indeed. So what uh, parts of the Joe Louis Greenway can people already experience? What, what can people already do? I know you talked a little bit about fitness kicking off, so go ahead. Yes. So, you know, the Joe Louis Greenway Partnership, so my organization is a nonprofit. We were launched in 2022 to be a partner to the project, to be a partner to the residents, and to ensure that we are here to support the city and the residents to maintain the, the integrity and the beauty of the Greenway and to promote uh, programs and events on the Joe Louis Greenway. So what's the nonprofit really quickly? Yes. Yeah, so Joe Louis Greenway Partnership. All right. That's right. So that's <laughs> who we are. So we are a nonprofit and we I came on in April of 23. And from day one, I just jumped right into the community engagement. So I wanted to understand what the residents wanted to see and how we could be a support and a really strong partner. Uh, and so our goals are to focus on the ongoing community engagement. So we're there with the city, connecting with the residents, going to all the meetings. So that's happening. And then we wanted to make sure that we were launching programs that residents wanted to see, wanted to participate in, that would promote a good quality of life and health and wellness. So right now, uh, we have fitness programs five days a week. We have Coach Kari, who's out there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, one of the ideas I had was, you know, the city put out uh, the fitness equipment at the Warren Trailhead. That's on West Warren, uh, west of Livernois. So it is a beautiful four acre park that opened last October on Halloween with and it kicked off with this amazing Halloween celebration for for the community. Uh, that park is the first of the first of its kind in that neighborhood in a long time. There are other amazing parks around it, but to have this park that is this attraction that is drawing in people from all over. When we go out there, there are people from, you know, West Bloomfield to the east side, to the west side, to southwest, to Dearborn, Hamtramck, coming all to Detroit to experience that park. And not to downtown, but to the neighborhood. Exactly, which yeah. is amazing. Like you said, it's one thing that we often hear about uh, uh, from residents and from those is on social media in general. So much attention to downtown. We're not getting enough attention in the neighborhoods. But when you hear about these little things that are happening, not little things, excuse me, major. big things, major mm -hmm. things that are happening in the city of Detroit, connecting all of these great uh, experiences that we can have as residents is really, really good that we actually talk about that recreation that's available for us. So as we continue to talk about the, uh, the Joe Lewis Greenway, we continue to talk about what uh, the, the footprint's going to be. You talked a little bit about it, it being a regional mm -hmm. project. So go into that footprint, expanding that eco footprint for Detroit and, and throughout the region as well. Yeah. You know, when I think about it being a regional project, meaning that 
the amount of residents that it is impacting, right, is, is the volume of residents. So if you look at how many people live within one mile of the Greenway, which live within walking distance or biking distance of the Greenway, um, and the population in these cities growing, we're going to get to over 100,000 people who live within one mile of the Greenway because it's a loop, right? So it's going from the riverfront to all of the rest of these these neighborhoods. And again, with the Iron Bale Trail, the idea that you can go from the Greenway to the Iron Bale Trail and go all the way up to Ironwood. And then the trailhead being this amazing, this wonderful development that was uh, opened up where we are doing programming, we're hosting events. We just had last week the City of Detroit's Bike Summit. We partnered with the Office of Mobility and Innovation, and we had a bike summit where we focused on safety. We had vendors, we had food, but we got all of the bike groups, you know, a lot of the bike groups in the city out there, and there were about 200 people that came out to that event. And so they rode uh, about four miles from Warren, and this is newly constructed, safe, right, Mm -hmm. pedestrian and biking path. And so it can't be overestimated enough that creating pathways that are safe in our city for our families and individuals to get around. And it's about mobility, but it's about recreation. It's about transportation. It's about all of these things. And people are now using it. You know, as that last mile, if I caught the bus, I can jump on, I can get on the Joe Louis Greenway and I can walk that last mile. It's paved, it's well lit, um, it's beautiful, and it's right in my neighborhood. And, you know, we talked, you talked about it a little bit earlier, 30%, you said, I believe, of Metro De- or Detroiters do not have access to a car. So something like this uh, does improve walkability within the city. If you can go into the idea of expanding walkability so that way we are, I guess, less uh, reliant on our vehicles. Yeah. I, you know, Tia, I think the important thing for me is that residents have choices and options, that you are not forced into a life that says, if you don't own a car, you can't get to work or you can't get your kids to school. And creating a path, a shared use path, protected shared use path, and most of it um, is a way to increase safety, increase walkability. There, uh, There's another statistic just about Detroit having a high rate of uh, pedestrian fatalities in the country, right? And we need to look at our country. How do we slow our roads down? How do we make it safe for our children? How do we make it safe for, for anyone who wants to travel to and from? We are chatting with, or we have been chatting with, Liana Metley, the executive director of the Joe Louis Greenway Partnership. Thank you so much for joining us on the Metro, talking about the Joe Louis Greenway and everything that we can expect as Detroit residents. So thank you, and Metro Detroit residents, and those who are just traveling to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, both of you. It's the Metro on 101.9 WDET and with President Biden visiting Detroit today, we'll talk with a Michigan Democrat who's making the case for Biden's presidential reelection campaign when we return on the Metro. to the Metro on 101.9 WDETFM. And as we all know, we are in a very big election year. And Nick, it is seeming to be a very uh, contentious one as well. Yeah, it is right now. The stakes seem very high. One of the reasons why this evening President Joe Biden will speak in Detroit at a re-election rally, marking his second event uh, visit to the city in just two months And it comes amid growing calls for him to step down from his reelection campaign amid concerns about fitness for office, fitness for the campaign following his first televised debate against former President Donald Trump. For his part, during a press conference Thursday night, Biden said he won't be stepping down and affirmed his belief that he needs to stay in the race to finish the job he started. But again, with all eyes on Michigan as one of the pivotal swing states in the race and recent polling indicating Biden's trail. Trump right here in Michigan. What do Democrats make of the current stakes and what is the best plan for November? To answer these questions and more, we're joined by Michigan Speaker of the House Joe Tate, a Democrat from Detroit. Speaker Tate, welcome to the Metro. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think is President Biden's best case for undecided voters in Detroit, as well as those who are just thinking about sitting this election out? 
You know, I think at the end of the day, uh, his best case is to talk about all of the accomplishments that he has um, has gotten done uh, for for Detroit residents, for Michigan residents, and for American over the past three and a half years. I mean, he has had one of the most consequential administrations. Uh, presidential administrations that we've seen uh, ever in American history. And I think the president continuing to talk about that and then us as Democrats being able to stay focused, to be able to meet voters where they are and and to be able to back him up on those accomplishments and everything that he's done for America. You know, I think many Democrats would agree with you that he has been very consequential in terms of the past four years, but the concern is the next four. One of the reasons why several people in the party are now calling for President Biden, as we mentioned, to step down from the reelection bid, including Grand Rapids Democrat uh, Rep. Hillary Skolton, who said, for the good of our democracy, I believe it is time for him to step aside from the presidential race and allow a new leader to step up. What do you think she is missing and why do you think Biden should stay in the race? You know, I think everyone does have you know their opinions, but looking at not only his administration, what he's done, but also we had a presidential primary election here in the state of Michigan and overwhelmingly Democratic voters uh, got behind President Biden. Uh, they want to see four more years of the work that he's been doing. Uh, so I, I think staying the path and, and, and showing, you know, just like President Biden and, and Vice President Harris have been doing uh, for the past several years is incredibly important. And not to mention, you know, what are we seeing on the other side with Trump? Uh, and I think that's something that needs to be talked about more because you have, you know, you have two people, the president of the United States, uh, who is, has dedicated his life to service has been an effective uh, president, an effective leader. And then on the other side, you have Trump, who is just spouting lies and is just concerned about him, nobody else but himself. Uh, And I think that's something that we really need to focus on, ensuring that we don't get Trump back in the White House. I think President Biden is, is our best shot for us to do that. I think that's where the tension point would be here then, Speaker Tate, because, again, I think a lot of Democrats would agree, but the question would be who's the best person to carry that message forward. For example, according to the Washington Post, Biden trails Trump by three and a half points in post-debate national polls compared to a one-point edge on Trump or Trump had before the debate. Meanwhile, there's also reporting that Vice President Kamala Harris is polling better than Biden in head-to-head polls against Trump. So for you then, would that go to the messaging of what's happening here? Because I think some would say we agree there are issues with Donald Trump, but maybe President Biden's not the best messenger when you look at numbers like this. Yeah, I think that goes back to, you know, Democrats being focused. I, I think being able to share that message because we do have you know, on the ticket is Biden-Harris. So we know that the president and the vice president, uh, the president has been, um, you know, incredibly focused on on moving this country forward. But also the vice president has been involved and engaged uh, in that as well. They are running as a team uh, when, when you look at all of that work. And I think that's something that, is going to be incredibly important. So it's not just President Biden carrying the message, uh, even though he is, he is the leader um, of, of our country, uh, but it's also others and, and us being able just to stay focused and say, let's meet people where they are. Let's tell people about the accomplishments of the Biden-Harris administration. Let's talk about, you know, uh, caps on insulin. Let's talk about investments in HBCUs and the work that's been done around workers in uh, health care. Let's, let's send that message. And I think if we do that, that lays a path for another four years 
uh, for the Biden Harris administration. You know, I'm glad you brought up the strategy there also because, and as well as what people are seeing, as again, we're speaking with uh, Speaker, Michigan Speaker of the House Joe Tate, a Democrat from Detroit, who's making the case for President Biden right now. And one of the things people saw was in terms of getting that message out there, how is he going to perform, for example, at the NATO summit yesterday? And during the NATO summit, when introducing Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, President Biden said this. And now I want to hand it over to the president of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. (laughs) President Putin. He's going to beat President Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin, we got to worry about it. Anyway. You know, Speaker Tate, it's just a name flub. He corrected himself in real time. We all acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's errors like these which appear to folks to be increasing in frequency when I'm talking to people, which have them concerned about, again, just that next four years portion of it. So with the acknowledgement that that's what people are seeing, what is the messaging? What does it take to get them on board to understand, even though I have these concerns about the next four years, uh, you should allay. We can allay them. Well, I, I would say, Nick, you know, coming up to Lansing, being in the chamber, the amount of times I get in front of the chamber and, and maybe have a flub, yeah. you know, if, if everyone looked at at that um, and not the effectiveness of what Democrats have been doing for the past year and a half in Michigan, um, of course, that, that, that will be something. But I think all of that at the end of the day serves as a distraction. Mm. You know, we had the end of the NATO summit uh, that the president was leading on. Uh, I think that's been incredibly important. I mean, when you look at, you know, the alliances, you look at the history of NATO, we need people, we need a, a, a strong hand on the wheel. Uh, and President Biden has shown that time and time again. And I think when you look at some of these, whether it's, you know, someone saying that he misspoke or it was a flub, um, I think we need to talk about the the entire body of work, you know, leading us out of a pandemic. Uh, again, mentioning, you know, the work that we've done around health care, getting our economy back on track, um, the number of jobs that we create, he's created, inflation lowering. I think that speaks more. I think that resonates more. But, again, we have to we have to stay focused as Democrats. We have to be able to tell that story. And I think if we do, um, and contrast that with the lies that Trump has been talking about um, and everything that he says, uh, I think we will be successful. Yeah. You know, just one more thing for you, Speaker uh, Tate. And again, we appreciate your time. It's just something that you said earlier about Biden winning the Michigan primary. We know that that primary was a little bit more limited. Right. You had Dean Phillips in it. But for the most part, historically in our country, when you're the president, they kind of clear the field for you. And I suspect that's what happened here as well. So to the extent that he went through a primary, it wasn't like a full primary when you have an open seat. Uh, What would you say to someone who would question, well, wait, that was the the will of the people when there was just a limited set of candidates in the first place. Can we truly say that was the case? And when, when we he went through that, uh, uh, went through that uh, process. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Just like it was the case, as you mentioned, you know, it was, it was a different primary than 2020, but it's still our primary is still, you know, our opportunity um, to get out and to uh, show our voice. All right. And I think overwhelmingly, Democrats are supported Joe Biden, and I think we're going to continue to support them into November. We're going to leave it right there for you. But Michigan Speaker of the House and Detroit Democrat Speaker Joe Tate, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Yes, sir. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. Today will reach 82 degrees, partly cloudy skies. Tomorrow, Saturday, will heat up. We'll see a high of 88 degrees with sunny skies. Sunday, there will be a high of 87 degrees with a chance of rain and thunderstorms. So definitely be prepared for a little bit of a heat up as well. Get those uh, goulashes out. Do we still call them that? I have no, I don't say goulash. But then again, my feet also get wet all the time when it rains. So maybe I'm not the one to be talking about. 
for rainy day footwear. I Tia. mean, I have I have my rainy day boots. Make sure <laughs> I keep those boots going. These but, boots are made for walking. But for this segment, I am the person to talk to about what's coming up next. And yeah. that's going to be the impact of Rite Aid's leaving Michigan. We may have fewer pharmacies pretty soon in the state. We're going to talk about why, why it matters, what's leading to it. All of this when we return on the Metro. This is the Metro on 101.9 WDETFM, and the impact of losing Rite Aid and its pharmacies may actually be pretty big for a lot of people. Yeah, Michigan doesn't have as many pharmacies as it used to, and that's going back about 20 years when we look at the numbers. The state has lost about 500 retail pharmacies, according to Crane's reporting, and now pharmacy access is projected to get worse this month as, as you mentioned, Tia, 185 Rite Aid stores are expected to close close in Michigan as the company files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. What does this mean for customers and what does it mean for pharmacies? And is there anything that can be done to more easily help people get their prescriptions? To discuss this now, we're joined by Lynette Moser, who is the chair and associate professor for the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at Wayne State University. Professor Moser, welcome to the Metro. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we get into what it means now that Rite Aid is leaving Michigan based on this reporting, can you give us a little bit of context in terms of how big a deal these pharmacies are, both for customers as well as doctors who refer patients to them and their, the access that they have to uh, the drugs that we need? We, The pharmacy, the local pharmacy, plays a really important role for our patients and we know that there's online pharmacies and there's mail order pharmacy, but going to your local pharmacy provides the opportunity for patients to ask questions, to talk about their over-the-counter medications, that maybe they need their local pharmacist there to be able to talk about how that would interact with their disease states, how it would interact with other medications that they're already on. So that's a really important place for the local pharmacy there's a lot of other things, too, that we get at the local pharmacy. People don't always think about the role that it plays in vaccinations now, mm -hmm. especially even before COVID. But with COVID, the majority of vaccines were actually given in the local pharmacy. So without that access for patients, they would end up having to make a clinic appointment that would increase the cost for both the patient and the healthcare system. To return to that. You know, when I think about Rite Aid, I remember a pharmacy called Perry Drugs. Yes. And then absolutely. everywhere I saw Perry Drugs that used to be, I all of a sudden saw a Rite Aid. Now, I wasn't old enough to be going through a transition of pharmaceuticals at that time. But when you talk about the connection that customers have with their local pharmacist, what would we be looking at it with all of these Rite Aids moving out? Is it going to be a situation where they just pick up the, another store like a CVS, just picks up these old locations and you still have your same pharmacist? What is this process going to look like? So currently the, um, the stated goal of Rite Aid is to transfer all of their prescriptions to a Walgreens that's nearby. But it would be a different pharmacist and a different pharmacy relationship. One of the things, speaking to that relationship with the pharmacist, I've been really very impressed with all of the people I've talked to that work at Rite Aid and how much they care about this process for their patients. It's really all about the patient. So they want to make sure that the patient knows where to go, knows where their prescriptions are transferred to. And that really adds a weight of cognitive distress, I think, to the people that are losing their jobs because of the Rite Aid's closing, because they really just want to make sure that the parent, the patients are getting the care that they need. Yeah, well, that is another thing, the pharmacists that we would lose. I don't know what kind of market that there is for other pharmacists right now. I know there's a tight labor market, but do we? what is the fallout that we would look at for, out for that? Is there a place for these folks to go, or what are you looking at there? We're looking at a lot of our alumni that are concerned mm. about their positions as they move forward. One of the things that we're very proud of in our education in general is that our students all get over 2,000 hours of direct patient care experience as part of their training. So they're trained at a very high level to provide direct patient care that doesn't need to be related to a product. So what we would like to see to fill that gap in the market is for our 
pharmacists to do more direct patient care and provision for pharmacists. We have a lot of pharmacists that work in ambulatory care, a lot of pharmacists that work in inpatient pharmacy that could do a lot of things that could improve patient care and patient outcomes, Mm -hmm. looking at optimizing therapy, looking at educating patients, doing things to improve adherence. So one of the things we would like to see is this on the state and the federal level to see pharmacists given provider status so they can do these activities that aren't product related and still obtain reimbursement for those things. So this then gets to access a little bit. Actually, mm-hmm. it makes me think of two things. One, the state role, but as well, access. So let's start with access, right? Once you reduce this number of pharmacies, maybe in a more densely populated area like a Detroit, you can survive that. But once you start getting out to some of these other locations, I would get concerned then that, hey, what about the pharmacy that was the local town pharmacy if it was a Rite Aid getting removed? What is this going to do for access that we're looking at right now? There's a lot of concern about that, that there's discussion about pharmacy deserts where there's these areas that are maybe in rural communities, but really don't forget the importance of those local pharmacies in a really urban setting. So the amount of pharmacies that are being lost, even in urban Detroit, is concerning for patient access. Yeah. So then people won't have that access to the person that they can talk to easily People will still be able to get medications through online and mail order pharmacy, but as I pointed out, there's really a lack then of some of the other services that pharmacists can give, both through like vaccinations and other uh, services that are offered. Well, then let's close it out here again as we're speaking with Lynette Moser of the uh, Wayne State University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. If we're thinking about, you've made the case for how important these services are, maybe expanding the ability for pharmacists to receive um, uh, recompense, to receive money for services that they provide. Is there a state role in this? Should we be looking at something like maybe public pharmacies? Could the state play an option in here? What would you say about that as an alternative? I would say the state can play a big role. We think of it first as legislation to give that uh, ability for pharmacists to get reimbursed for those cognitive services, and we call that provider status. So pretty much every state has tried to get provider status through the state legislation. Many states have. We're still working on that in Michigan. Another thing, and this is going a little bit different direction, but there's been a lot of concern about the role of PBMs, which is pharmacy benefit managers, in what's happening with the retail pharmacies in general. They're kind of a middleman who determines reimbursement and commonly will reimburse lower than acquisition costs. And the the retail pharmacies really identify this as a a big reason why there have been financial issues. This is something we see Medicare, Medicaid, all kinds of uh, services, this service popping up in terms of cost correction. Something else that we could probably get into a little bit later, but I know I got to let you go right now. So Lynette Moser, Chair and Associate Professor for the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at Wayne State University. Thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. And, you know, just hearing about that, I think about all the other things that we're seeing happen in the city of Detroit in terms of deserts and the way that they're being filled, like Detroit People's Co op with that food desert in that area, not any longer. So I love to see that. However, as we continue to transition on, we have things that are happening just outside of WDET studios right here in the Cass Corridor. There's an old church known as the Commons. This space has hosted a lot of different events, and tonight it's celebrating the music series Jazz at the Commons. Spearheaded in part by DJ Dion Jamar, tonight Jazz at the Commons will host legendary trumpeter Earl Davis, who's been playing for decades, and he used to tour with Sun Ra. WDET's Ryan Patrick Hooper spoke with Earl and Dion about why an event like Jazz at the Commons is important for the city's cultural scene. He began this conversation with Dion, exploring why the Commons is a special venue for this event. We've been talking about programming the space uh, with art and music for a while now, and it's beautiful. It happens uh, inside of the church that's inside of the Commons um, in the sanctuary. So just amazing acoustics, 
you know, obviously the significance of it being in a church, the energy that's already there. And, you know, the Commons is a historic landmark. So this is a very special place, especially for this music. that we do, we typically have to occupy spaces where that are not aligned. So this is um, it's very significant, you know, for the people that we have and the music that's being played and where it is and then who shows up, you know, just getting to that point of that healing that music is supposed to provide for people. This is like a thankless work. We're not doing this for money. You know, we're doing this for culture. What motivates you to want to put on Jazz at the Commons and in particular in this space? Because a lot of people wouldn't get off the couch if they weren't going to get a check for, for whatever they were doing. So I think it's important to ask people, like, what motivates them to do something that's beyond the dollar? The healing. I mean, all of us in varying degrees need music, some of us more than others. Most of us are not well, and especially ever since COVID, quarantine and all of that, we need it now more than ever. So... Yeah, it's really about the healing. Like, that is the re. It's not just about entertaining someone or, you know, trying to pacify. Like, even the term you know, jazz, like, we're just using that as a trigger it's for you to know what you're about to walk into. But even when you walk in, like, it'll be jazz, it'll be hip hop, it'll be soul, it'll be funk, it'll be just a black music, it'll be our music, you know? So, but that's our reason, though, just to share that healing with people. Earl, let's get you in the mix here. Um, yeah. How old are you today? Today I'm 86. Still going. Still going. Playing Friday. I, for, I forgot to look old and act <laughs> old. <laughs> but my body lets me know. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what people can expect when you're on stage on Friday in this venue performing. Since residing here in Detroit, I've put together a couple of bands. The latest is Detroit Brain Stretching Medicine Band. I love that name. Yeah. And it's all about, I'm trying to convey to the new world of this 21st century of li perceiving music in a different way from the last century. You know, present the music in an entirely different way. And there will be some uh, dialogue to introduce people to what's going on. You know, if they come in and just feel like they're alienated by the, what they're hearing, I have to kind of maybe prep them verbally. And then the players, we already know what we're going to do. That was jazz musician Earl Davis and DJ Dion Jamar. They spoke with WDET's Ryan Patrick Hooper. Earl Davis will perform tonight at Jazz at the Commons at 4605 Cass Avenue. The event starts at 8 p.m. And you can find more information at jazzatthecommons.org. It's the Metro on 101.9 WDET. But that's not the only music-related celebration that's happening this evening. Coming up, we'll discuss a new exhibit, exhibit that's celebrating Detroit producer Jay Dilla. This is the Metro here on 1019 WDETFM. 
and you know Nick, someone who's a DJ. You're a DJ. I'm a DJ. DJ Nick. <laughs> and DJ, DJ Nick. DJ not guilty from the legal days, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me laughing. Okay. So DJ Nick, you know about Jay Dilla. You knew about Jay Dilla, of course, possibly as he was making his beats in uh, Detroit. So yeah. you know, just having this conversation right now is pretty cool. Such a celebration. You know, there's been a couple of ways that people are celebrating Dilla this weekend, and one of the coolest is jumping off today as Wayne State University debuts. It's I Got Beats in These Fingertips exhibition, celebrating the groundbreaking contributions of not just Detroit's Jay Dilla, but also DJ Screw out of Houston. The exhibition kicks off this evening at 5 p.m. with an opening reception featuring Detroit Poet Laureate Jessica Care Moore in King Moore. But to learn more about the exhibition, we're joined by its co-curators, Wayne State University Professor Thomas Przewski, as well as DePaul University Professor Zach Ostrowski. Gentlemen, welcome to the Metro. Thank Happy you. to be here. Thanks. So Thank let's start with you, since you are our local guy, Tom. I got beats in these fingertips celebrating, again, the work of these uh, figures in hip-hop. Uh, why did you decide to connect these two, and what was the, the inspiration behind this exhibit? Oh, uh, The inspiration was obviously Jay Dilla, and then um, uh, there's a lot of exhibitions that, um, that uh, hip-hop, exhibitions that focus on east and west coast and we wanted to focus on houston mm. and dj screw is a anchor to the exhibition with jay dill as the um, other anchor uh, representing detroit and then um also it's a 50th uh celebration for jay dilla too yeah and you know both dilla and dj screw known mostly for music but this is an exhibit that features a host of visual art pieces so before we get into uh, what you can specifically see there was there a specific goal in connecting visual art to musical work or how does one even go about trying to create something like this zach yeah, well, Tom and I are part of a art collective that brings together music and design, fine art, writing, and performance. And we've done shows before at the Detroit Institute of Arts, bringing together performance art and hip hop. And now we wanted to focus on visual art as well. And it's something we've been doing since the late 90s, and it's an ongoing effort of ours. And Wayne State is super forward thinking in this exhibition, bringing those together. Um, George Clinton. Uh, has some paintings. Most people don't know he's also a painter, so we have some of his works that you'll be able to see at the show tonight. Got to believe that's pretty psychedelic when you're talking about the funk pioneer George (laughs) Clinton, Parliament, Funkadelic, all of that. But looping you back in here, Tom, then we just heard about George Clinton paintings. What are some of the other standout pieces that people can see at the exhibit? And especially if you can tell us anything that makes them unique. Um, one, one, one example I would like to share is, um, there's this, uh, company called pen and pixels out of Florida. And, um, when Zach and I were both kids, uh, we used to get the source magazine and they had just the, a ton of ads, um, with these like really, um, avant-garde like designs, uh, for their album covers. And we would just buy, buy the albums before even listening to them based on the covers. So, we have 129 um, uh, feature designs by Pennant and Pixel. Yeah, I'll tell you, I've seen a bunch of terrible movies from Blockbuster based on that exact same thesis. Uh, <laughs> you, you definitely cannot judge a book by its cover, probably not an album also, although there is some good music that's referenced here in this exhibit, and that's why I'm going to loop you back in, Zach. Let's talk about what people can expect when they come to this show, right? It's musicians, but what are other things people are going to see that yeah. they can't see anywhere else? Uh, well, one of the things is a debut new spoken word piece by Jessica Care Moore. Um, that's a tribute to Dilla. So that's going to be a sound installation. We also have a 10 foot optical print by Brian Cross, B plus. He's one of the, the foremost hip hop photographers. This this print has never been exhibited before, mm-hmm. so it makes its debut here. Um, and there's also Isham, uh, another pioneer, sonic pioneer from Detroit defining place through his music uh we have personal artifacts of his beat machine that he used to make his first album and the rare red tape uh that's highly sought after is going to be on display and and a lot more you have to come out and see it man if you are a hip-hop head it seems like there's going to be some really interesting pieces here but uh for you guys i want to get an idea tom again the music idea and linking it with art 
as a curator, when you're selecting these pieces, is there a specific story you're trying to tell? What inspires you to choose one thing from another? Because there's a whole host of stuff that you could probably try to get in here. So how do you narrow that focus and decide this is what we think will make sense for this exhibit? Yeah, the possibilities for this kind of exhibition are unlimited, and it's really difficult to narrow it down. Um, but it's exciting. It's it's um, We enjoyed uh, working with the concept. But um, a lot of it's based on... Um, the, the space itself, and uh, as the viewer walks in, there's sort of a timeline. There's uh, the viewers um, all ultimately like will walk counterclockwise around the gallery, and the gallery's by level. So we think about placement of everything in sight line and um, have key moments that are uh, visually impactful for the viewer to be drawn to. So I want to ask this question to both of you, Zach and Tom. I, I'm hearing what you're talking about, and it's the first thing that threw, drew my mind. I saw DJ Screw, and and for me, I'm of course new to the hip hop. Not new to hip hop, but I wasn't there in back in the day when everyone was doing all these cool things. But I think about the rappers today that I listen to, like Megan Thee Stallion, mm-hmm. who very much uses the style that DJ Screw uh, created in Houston. So if you could go into the generational connections there and the importance of teaching people like myself who the heck DJ Screw is in the first place and why people like Megan Thee Stallion and Bun B have these sounds. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a regional sound, really. It started as that. It, def- it came out of the, the place, and it's connected to the local culture. So Detroit and Houston both have that, but that influence has spread, like you said, beyond generations, beyond place, and New York gets a lot of attention, obviously, uh, and we wanted to shed a light on Houston and Detroit, which are equally important. They've transcended into pop culture, but sometimes get left out of the narrative. Um, so that's the teaching component of the show. Awesome. Awesome. And Tom, you know, just really quickly, Jessica Care Moore. Of course, we know she's huge hip hop poet, more than just a hip hop poet, but she's amazing a poet here in the city of Detroit. Why Jessica, of course? Well, um, Jessica is just, um, I've been following Jessica for the longest time and, um, uh, again, Zach and I worked on a project with her at the Detroit Institute of Arts, and she was just amazing. And um, she's just a, a heck of a performer, and we thought it would be a great to highlight her and then have her perform at the opening itself. And um, I want to mention, too, she's uh, her por- her performance is going to be with her son, King Moore, who put together the beats. Mm, King, who we've been hearing about and, and can't wait to hear from King. Nick. That's right. It goes down tonight at 5 p.m. But, gentlemen, I guess we'll have to end it right here. But uh, Zach Ostrowski of DePaul University, if you ever need voiceover work, let us know because that booming bass. Hey, yeah. yeah. Booming. I'm, I'm ready to work. Let's go. <laughs> hey, 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 Nick, yeah. dude, could, I, could I put a plug in? Come on Jessica? with it. Yeah. All right. Jessica is going to debut her film, um, He looked like a postcard Thursday, August 8th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Imagine Theater in Royal Oak. All right, Tom Przewski, thank you again for joining us as well on the Metro. Thank you so much. And that's going to do it for the Metro. Before we close out, I have a little bit of personal news to share with you all today, as this is my last episode as a daily co-host for the Metro. But hosting the show and other programs here on the station has been a dream come true for me. Growing up, always aspired to be on the radio. And I want to thank all of you listening, as well as this amazing station, for allowing me to fulfill that dream. Your support and engagement have been the only thing that makes it possible. And I can only hope that I helped you also have some brighter days, maybe be a little bit more informed. But like I said, right now I've been presented with a unique opportunity to get back to the legal field, which I got to take this time. Can't pass up one of those now or never situations. But I'm confident to move on because of the team we have here. Tia, Sam, Dave, Adam, Mary, all the folks here. You guys are in great hands. So what I'm asking for you guys is to continue listening to this show. And while I won't be on WDET, Airwaves Daily, I'm still going to be contributing content. I'm still a sub-in host here, on-air host at other times. 
You're still going to see me, but I look forward to they staying connected you. with all you guys. You can't see. Well, you can if Dave Kim's true, always coming very over true. here like, with You're the like video. John Cena. They can't see you. They can <laughs> oh, hear you. They can't see you. His name is Nick Austin. Oh. Da, 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 da. <laughs> hey, I'm coming back. I just want to thank all you guys for making my time here special. I'm still here, though. Why am exactly. I saying goodbye? I'm That's still what I'm here. saying. I'm like, what's happening? I'm just not here daily. Exactly. So, you know, uh, as this transition is taking place, we are looking for a permanent replacement. But in the meantime, we will be uh, calling some of our friends to help us out. Uh, to the Metro and I want to say thank you to those who will be co-hosting with me Vicki Thomas uh, Malachi Barrett from Bridge Detroit we'll have Robin Vincent from Chalk Beat Orlando Bailey from Outlier and Colin Jackson from Michigan Public Radio Network I want to say thank you of course Nick and like you're not leaving you'll be here like I said can't see you but you'll be we'll hear you I will maybe this time I won't be like all choking up when I gotta do more on air stuff it's hard it, to it, you know it gets hard <laughs> out here but we're not gonna go with it but it definitely gets hard out here sometimes but you know we handled it and yeah. you know the pressure though because you're you're going to be back in the law field I, I, right you, you know, know no exactly pressure. man no exactly right man I, why did, I should have never told him I had a law degree in the first place <laughs> no. should have never got lessons <laughs> what was I thinking that's going to do it for this edition of the Metro Friday July 12th you can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform this show is produced by Sam Corey David Lyons and Jack Phil Brandt. additional production support from Anil Scott and Sydney Walkley our engineer here is Nate Bender music by Sam Bobian and Will Sessions. Oh, T, you're giving this to me one last time, huh? Yeah. This is WDET FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Thanks for listening. T, we'll see you on Monday. Mm-hmm. WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new master's degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. More information at business.udmercy.edu.